Welcome to this episode of Opportunity Knocks. I am your host, the Rev Raw, and today I have my special guest host, the wonderful Mary V. Mary, say hi. Hey, Mary and Chica in the house. Woo woo. <laughs> and then we also have another special guest. Introduce yourself, guest. <laughs> uh, I'm Darby, uh, part of Chica. Thank you. So today we're going to talk about some topics that have been very near and dear to our hearts. Mary, why don't you start us off? <laughs> Well, um, I just got done with a workshop today at Valley College. I was uh, a part of a, a organizing that we've been doing this week around Undocumented Student Action Week, which is a statewide thing that's happening at all the community colleges or many community colleges. And uh, we've been doing a lot of workshops to support undocumented students, dreamers, really any students that are kind of marginalized uh, and lack access to education. So our workshop today was about uh, how to pay for college. And I specifically talked a lot about scholarships. And I think that this is a really topic that hits home for me because when I was a student at Valley, the tuition was like $11 a unit at that time. And so a three unit class was like $33. Today, the tuition is like $46 a unit. So the same three unit class for a student is, you know, almost $150. And that's assu- assuming they get in-state tuition, right? Not right. out-of-state tuition, which is right. thousands of dollars. And so um, it brings up this whole issue about, for me, about scholarships and the history behind scholarships and and why, what was the intent behind scholarships and then financial aid which, of course, leads you to the question about, you know, student loans and student loan debt and the cost of higher education and and all these issues, which just kind of unravels very quickly into this huge conspiracy theory about education and access to education. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's 2018 and we're supposed to be on an equity tip, right? Like brown folks, indigenous folks, black folks, LGBTQ folks, like, It's supposed to be like access for education for all. But the real deal is that higher education is more and more and more unaffordable. Yes. Like our parents, our grandparents, they could afford to like hold down a job and go to school. But our students today, like when they feel like that's impossible, that's not imagination. Like the cost of higher education, like if you Google it right now and look at the cost of higher education compared to inflation, the inflation rate is like, you know, goes up a little bit. If you look at like medical costs, that goes up a little higher. If you look at housing costs, you know, you see it go up a little higher. But when you see higher education, it's like the friggin' graph goes through the roof. Yes. Because it has outpaced the inflation of everything else in the last 50 years. And so why is that happening? Why is all of a sudden higher education becoming so expensive? And supposedly we have all these aid programs, but it still feels inaccessible to really poor folks. Like, you know, right. so why? And, and it, it led me down this path where I started researching scholarships and I started figuring out, okay, so back in the day, scholarships was like, something where wealthy people gave money to other wealthy people. I don't know if you all knew this, but this was like a very class thing, like white folks and wealthy folks who were already rich would give scholarships to other wealthy folks so that they could keep higher education, like in the higher class, in the, in the, in the upper class. Mm-hmm. Would they tax exempt? Are they all tax exempt? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, so they would provide funding to like, to other wealthy folks. And then so when the, the colleges started getting on this diversity thing and equity thing, then all of a sudden, okay, now we have to have scholarships for, for brown and black folks and LGBTQ folks and Native American folks and all these other folks. Then all of a sudden, the cost of tuition doubled, tripled, quadrupled, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. quippled, like, mm-hmm. like, you know, we could just kept going. And it's because as the scholarship movement became more about equity uh you know they had to find another way to keep people of color Mm -hmm. out of the you know college educating Mm -hmm. class so that ends up turning into student loan debt right Mm -hmm. so like i think anybody who's taken out student loans 
knows what that looks like and what that feels like. Yes. And it's to the point now where our youth who are brown and black, you know, who are undocumented LGBTQ, they have to take up these huge amounts of student loans Mm -hmm. to graduate. And sometimes they can't even get all the way through their programs to get like a good paying job. So they end up working at a warehouse Mm -hmm. to pay off their student loans instead of a career, which they've been promised as a part of their degree. Mm -hmm. And it's like this big ass conspiracy. Like, So Mary, can I pause you real quick and kind of go back? So at the community college level, like, are students having to take out loans there now as well? Well, at, at our particular community college, we don't, uh, we, for a long time, we didn't do student loans. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think students uh, do take out loans because even if they don't take them out at the college, they can go to like Bank of America or right. Wells Fargo and take out private loans. And a lot of students do that so that they can afford textbooks or right. because their financial aid doesn't come in on time. Right. So the reality of it, of it for students is like the loan debt is literally crushing. It. Mm-hmm. Like I saw this cartoon image once of this student, you know, like kind of like the Atlas man, mm-hmm. but instead of the globe on his shoulders, it was student loan debt, like right. a giant bag of student loan debt, you know? And I think that's the reality for most students is right. like, they can be awesome academically. They can be, like hard workers, they can be like all these things. But at the end of the day, that loan debt is just like, it's so demoralizing Mm -hmm. and so crushing to your soul. Mm -hmm. And it just makes folks feel like, why do I even bother going to college? Well, I think the thing that people don't often think about is we were given this false promise, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I remember in high school, um, it was so force upon me that once you finish high school, you know, you'll be able to go to like your community college. Mm -hmm. And for me, yes, that was free. Mm -hmm. But the minute I got into higher education, going to Cal state, that's when the loan debt started. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky at the time to get out of with my bachelor's and only $10,000 in loan debt, Mm -hmm. but to go back for higher education, because again, that's that, that, weight that people put on you that you know what you don't want to stop just at a bachelor's you want to get that higher that more advanced degree because there are all these jobs that are out there you know that they tell you um when you look at the country that was it there's only three percent of people that have like a master's degree or an advanced degree so that means that you have this promise of the amount of money that you'll be able to make and in reality that's not really what it is um as i was telling you before we got started tonight i went and started my uh mba in a year, fifty thousand dollars in loan debt. Fifty thousand dollars, and that was because I was in the College of Business, and their program they had like a campus fee or something that was like eight hundred and sixty nine dollars a unit. So added on top of tuition, this other amount. Whereas for the rest of the campus, I think it was only like twenty nine dollars. It was something insane, but it was because that department was supposed to be one of the best in the country. And now I have this additional fifty thousand dollars in loan debt that I'll, I'll have until I pay off. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. the principal, not the interest. That's the principal. And what's the interest on that? <laughs> <laughs> so every year, right now, uh, it's anywhere from twelve to fifteen hundred or more. That's interest that's added each year. So right now, and keep in mind, I I changed grad programs. So now with being in seminary, that's another twenty to thirty thousand dollars. So I'm close to $100,000 in loan debt right now. Yeah, so this is really the thing, like, I really want to talk about, right? Because, I, like, when you really unpack that, you know, imagine, just imagine, you go to school for four, five, six years. You do everything they tell you to do. You get your degrees, you, you know, you, do, you do, it, do it all, right? And then you graduate from your school, you know, after like let's say you pursue a master's and you've been in school what eight years Mm -hmm. something like that you know nine years maybe Mm -hmm. and that's if you're lucky right if everything went perfect you know and then you have like some crazy amount of debt like you know 50 to to 80 thousand dollars of debt you Mm -hmm. know and it's like first for most people who live in our hood like we're talking about san bernardino right here right now like you know uh, for most people who live in in our hood, that like that that's like 
you know, some people don't earn that much money, you know, in a year, like right. a full time salary. So how, how are folks going to feel that education is an option for them if that is what it's built on? Right. And I really feel like one of the just to add more to the conspiracy mm -hmm. is that, you know, that the the loans are like the number one option. Right. You know, like you 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 get the financial aid from FAFSA and then whatever's unpaid, they're like student loans. They push it automatically. And the reality is there are tons of scholarships, but there's no information readily mm -hmm. available to most students about right. scholarships. So let me give you a hardcore example. At Valley College, we have uh, 11, 12,000 students roughly at Valley College. How many of 12,000 do you think apply for our inside scholarships where the scholarships are already, the money's already there at the college? Of, of 12,000, how many would you get apply for scholarships? I'd say less than 1%. Yeah. Yeah. You'd be, you'd be right. Like it's like something between 250 to 350 students <sighs> apply for scholarships out of 10, Thousand. That's insane. That's insane, right? And it's like, I've been talking about this for many, many years. Like, we used to have a fully functioning scholarship office, a scholarship mm -hmm. person. There was a, a woman, when I was a student, her name was Gloria Ceballos. Mm -hmm. And rest in peace. She passed a few years ago, oh. you know. I loved her very dearly. But she dedicated her whole life to giving students scholarships and studied them and, you know, knew, this was before computers, right? right. Like, she knew the organizations and she worked to memorize this information you could literally walk up to her tell her your major and she would rattle off 10 scholarships for you to apply for you know better than google right and and um it's like that has not been in place on our campus you know for for years and wow. i think that we have to get back to a place where we start telling our students you know, that investing in their education is the best thing we can do as a community. Mm -hmm. And that means we got to fund scholarships. We got to create scholarships. We got to promote scholarships. We got to make sure we apply for scholarships. We got to do all that so that we are not doing this crazy loan debt mm -hmm. and that we are not just saying it's okay for them to keep jacking up the price of education right. and just jacking up the amount of loan debt that we have. Because right now that's the society's solution to education. And I think that that's one of those things that really catches people because I'm not sure everyone is completely aware of what that process looks like. Because I remember as a student, that was around the time when I ended up messing up my credit because suddenly, um, I don't know if you remember this, they used to have um, people on campus passing out credit card applications, mm. knowing that people needed you know, to get these funds, whether it was for books or other things. And some people who were in need, they'd get those credit cards and max them out and then not have no way to pay them off. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's like this, this trap that's being set where it's like, you come out, let's say you're you're young, maybe 18 or even 17 now with the influx of students, and you have no experience. You don't know what credit is. You don't know how these things will impact you. But suddenly, here's this free money. Just, just apply. All we need is your social. And let's really talk about that, right? Like, so who is making a profit off of that? Who is making a profit off of the student loan debt? Right. And the tuition being five times what it was when we were in school. Right. Who is making a profit off that? Now, are you just saying big business or are you saying like the campus? No, it's definitely not the campus. I okay. can tell you that. Yeah. I've been there on that campus 20 years and I have not seen that flood of money come to our campus. It's the corporation, right? right? It's the banks, the big right. banks. And just like we always use that hashtag same villains, right? right. Hashtag same villains. Here you go again. The same damn villains, you know, are behind this, which are the same villains who are funding pipelines, right. the same villains who are building warehouses in our hood, the right. same villains who are making sure that, you know, Walmart stays ununionized. Right. Same villains okay. every time. And it's just crazy because, you know, I think back to, you know, getting out of the valley and then transferring to Cal State. And again, I just had this dream that, you know, once you get there, you'll get the education, you'll be able to get out and get your job, your dream job. And in reality, that didn't happen. And there was no one there to basically pick up the pieces afterwards. I had to figure it out on my own what I needed to do. 
And for me, that was to get a job Mm -hmm. and literally looking around. And my first job after that, I worked at Bed Bath & Beyond. That was not the business because I had went to school all that time, got all that education. And I probably had more education than a lot of people that were there. And nope, that's where I ended up. And that was so humbling because you realize, okay, this education, it's important. You're supposed to do this. You take on this debt. But in reality, what happens after? Yeah. And I think that's part of the cycle, right? Like the idea that you're going to be trapped working in a non-unionized job, in a job that is like, you know, very like barely making ends meet, barely paying off your student loans. Very that you're abusive. always just doing the minimum payment so you can't pay down the interest. Yep. And, and you stay trapped there. Yep. So then what happens is the folks who don't have to take student loans out, they graduate without any of that. Yep. They don't have any of that baggage. And they can, you know, wait for the perfect job to come along yep. and go after that career and do all those things that folks who have that kind of debt really just can't do. And, and or it's very rare. Right. And and so it's like it goes back to that whole thing of like, you know, how do we solve this issue? And I think I, I, I'm not one to be a conspiracy theorist all the time. Right. But this is one of those situations where I legitly think it's a conspiracy. <laughs> like these, you connect the dots on this. Higher and education was always supposed to be for the higher class. Always. It yeah. was always meant to be like that. Just even look at Latin America. You know, just Mexico, anywhere. It's, like, it's about having the money. It's about having the, the, you know, everything's private. There's no public schools. Mm-hmm. And, and if there is anything public, scholarships, that still falls into the same big business. Mm-hmm. It's ridiculous. It's worldwide. Mm-hmm. Worldwide. So I think like what we got to do is like really pay closer attention to like the people who are making those decisions. Like when we start to see tuition fee hikes, like we have to like adamantly oppose that. Mm-hmm. You know, we can't let the the legislator or the board of education or whoever's making those decisions mm-hmm. do those. Continue to make those those. Uh, decisions on the backs of our youth, you know, and especially our youth of color. And then at the end of the day, I think we've got to do a better job of funding education ourselves, like, you know, by creating our own community-based scholarships and also by um, kind of dismantling, you know, the education system. Like, we're here at a community space right now. There's no reason why we can't teach Chicano history here. Right. There's no reason why we can't teach, you know, uh, you know, reading in, yeah, re, uh, math, reading, mm-hmm. you know, like, um, you know, hands on skills like we can teach that here as well. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying to replace uh, the education, higher education institutions, but we definitely need to spread education more into the community in a way that's free and accessible to everybody. And I think, you know, to piggyback on that a little bit that, you know, with us talking about how scholarships are and how they're set up. I mean, I think this is also the space where we need to find someone to be the perfect resource that will know what all these scholarships are and walk people through the process Mm -hmm. and just let them know, look, when you go to this campus, they may not be here for you, but we're going to be here for you. Mm -hmm. And we're going to let you know exactly what you need and walk people through the process. If there's someone that needs to write an essay, have them write the essay, then bring the essay here. Let us proofread it for you. Let us, you know, work on resumes for you. Mm -hmm. Let us give you these skills that you're going to need for the real world. That's right on time, Matt, because guess what we're going to be doing? We're going to be offering workshops coming up in November. We're doing a series of workshops at Valley College for Mecha, for Puente, for uh, Human Services, for uh, different groups on campus that we know are marginalized and often left out of the application process. Mm. We're going to be doing scholarship workshops here at the space, uh, the 909 space in San Bernardino. And um, we'll do scholarship workshops for anybody who asks. So whoever is listening to this, no matter what school you're at, no matter what community you live in, you can contact us and we will host a free scholarship workshop for you, mm-hmm. telling you how to apply for scholarships and also how to create a scholarship. If you want to create a scholarship fund for your own community, for your own uh, you know, passion, whatever you're passionate about. Like maybe right now we're doing a podcast. How about communications? Right. A good communication scholarship for people of color. Right. Or how about a, a radio and TV film scholarship for LGBTQ? Right. You know, like we need to create those scholarships for our people 
from from the community so that the money goes to the right folks and not to corporations. And I think that that's something that we need to really highlight also. Um, because, oh, yeah, please, oh, please. Well, so, because I keep seeing royalty on the roof on this whiteboard. So I do want to make this announcement. It'll be the first announcement that I'm making. So we are celebrating five years. And with our five years, uh, we are um, I guess debuting our scholarship program. So uh, we're going to have it's a small scholarship, $500 uh, for a trans person of color, and that's just a trans person of color, higher education, that's all we really need. Uh, we're going to get into logistics of that more with uh, you know the board of directors and what have you, but that's a, the, one of the announcements that we'll be introducing, um, and which goes with what you're saying, LGBTQ focused. So uh, we the plan is to grow, to have multiple small scholarships and of you know, and then to get into bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm. You know, so five hundred dollar ones, thousand dollar ones, two thousand dollar ones, if we can even eventually go to full scholarship rides for trans people of color then and, and that's the ultimate goal. But I'm glad that after five years we're actually getting enough funding to push to just have even a few hundred dollars to put aside for somebody to help prevent this even if it's a credit card debt. Sometimes you're getting in debt for five hundred dollars per bus. Right. So let me add to that too. Is at Valley, uh, we started a regional scholarship in honor of John Trudell. Mm. Um, and if those of you who don't know, Google John Trudell right now and listen to his poetry and spoken word. He's one of our Native American alumni from Valley College who learned radio, television, and film at San Bernardino Valley College. And went on to start AIM Radio, where they occupied Alcatraz Island and as a um, revolutionary organizer for Native community. He was he, part of Smoke Signals? He impacted tons of people. Yes, he was part of Smoke Signals. Oh, was he the one that wrote John Wayne's Teeth? Yes, and so it's like... Oh my God, I love that song. <laughs> I'm Googling him like you told me to. <laughs> uh, and so that scholarship, we have a special poetry festival every November called the John Trudell Poetry Festival, mm. where we feature some poets. Uh, this year, we'll be having a, a guest poet from Puerto Rico, and um, we also do some fundraising there to um, actually raise money for his scholarship. And we also do that at our De Los Muertos event, which is going to be November 1st at San Bernardino Valley College where we will also be uh, having a little collection in memory of John Trudell and um, ha making sure all those funds go to his scholarship. Thank you for sharing that. <clears throat> um, so what I was just going to bring up, um, if you could maybe speak on it just a little bit more um, about the undocumented student series that's happening right now. Sure. Undocumented Student Action Week is a week of workshops that are happening. We we started with How to Pay for College. Um, we uh, did that workshop today. Tomorrow, we're going to be doing a Know Your Rights training and an ally training. So we're going to have a bunch of organizations in the house that work with immigrant community, um, a lawyer that's going to talk about Know Your Rights. And Know Your Rights is very important for all students, not just undocumented students. Like it's super important to know what your rights are and to be able to exercise them and know how to do that. Uh, tomorrow also is going to be a police brutality event at Valley mm. College at 12 noon, uh, where our mechistas will be uh, organizing and talking about uh, police brutality and supporting a lot of the grassroots organizations that fight against police brutality in our community. And then Thursday, we're going to be talking about mental health and self-care for dreamers, but also for all students. Um, we're going to actually be hosting a healing circle on the grassy area in front of the library. And um, we really hope to talk to students about their mental health and self-care so that they can be taking care of that in a really positive way right. um, and not doing things like self-medicating and other things that are just going to lead them down a path that could be very harmful for them. Um, and giving them basically just more tools so that they can deal with their mental health uh, in a more positive way and also to kind of break the stigma out of that so that we can talk about it and share with each other all of our struggles, no matter where we come from. And then we're closing out the week uh, with our Advocate with Art, 
we mm. had uh, Fabiana Rodriguez uh, on Monday at the college, who's the person who created the uh, Dreamer butterfly that is commonly used. Mm. And so we've been doing a canvas all week with camp prints, which will be made into butterfly images. And then that will be on display in our Dreamer Center at San Bernardino Valley College. So we invite you to come down um, any day. Most things are starting at like 11 o'clock, uh, 11 or 12 around there. So if you come around your lunch hour, you can pop in and, and get some great information and enjoy some snacks with us and do some art with us mm. and uh, even get some healing and mental health self-care. So with that <clears throat> being said, Let's talk a little bit about um, two specific measures that are impacting the Inland Empire, or specifically San Bernardino. Um, those are Measure W and Measure X. So I was telling you earlier that I got um, I googled the basic information about Measure W, which says it's a an ordinance imposing a cannabis business tax of up to ten dollars per square foot for cultivation and up to six percent of gross receipts on other businesses operating in the city of San Bernardino. It's estimated to initially raise between 810000 to $2.4 million annually, with the funds staying local for unrestricted general revenue purposes, including but not limited to police services, street repairs, parks and library services, and it will stay in effect until changed by voters. With Measure X, Measure X is about limiting the amount of actual um, um, growth facilities that can be in San Bernardino and stores. If I'm not mistaken, the current number is 17 that they'd be able to, or that we would be able to have in the city of San Bernardino. We bring this up because um, this is a major action that's happening um, for uh, medical marijuana or marijuana uh, legislation in the state, and specifically our county, that impacts um, people that have traditionally been known for being incarcerated for this reason. Uh, Mary, you said that you had some more information about how the cannabis business had been impacted by the mayor? Yes, like, <laughs> I'm, I guess I'm on a conspiracy theory <laughs> joint today. But, um, so there is this whole, um, you know, uh, political kind of um, circle that's been happening in San Bernardino. Um, a while back, we had Mayor um, Pat Morris, and um, he there was a recall election to remove him from his seat as mayor. Um, there were a lot of accusations that there was uh, too much money uh, being spent on raises for police and fire, and uh, and a lot of controversial issues in the city about that. Um, so Mayor Kerry Davis ran on a recall uh, election campaign to replace. Uh, you know, Mr. Morris, and um, as a part of that, it promised not to do the same things and promised to support, uh, you know, a lot of innovation to get the city out of the state that it was in. Um, and then there's a lot of criticism happening right now that 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 he did not follow through on those promises, um, that there was a lot of, um, you know, same deals kind of made with the current mayor as with the past mayor, um, and a lot of uh, over dependency on solving all the city's problems by, uh, you know, having a lot of police as the answer for everything. And those of us who work in the frontline community, we know that is not, you know, just arresting folks for smoking weed is not going to solve the city's problems. Right. Um, that the problems are bigger than that and issues are bigger than that. And police is, is not going to be the solution. Um, so, that prompted uh, other candidates to run for mayor, and uh, one of those candidates is uh, John Valdivia, mm -hmm. and um, he's, you know, very much was running uh, uh, on a ticket where he was um, basically, you know, outwardly very supportive of uh, cannabis dispensaries mm -hmm. and getting donations from them and their packs and uh, making promises, you know, to mm -hmm. them. And I think when the current mayor saw this, he said, oh, yeah, that's not good. So I don't want to support something that's supporting my opponent. So what kind of went after the cannabis uh, dispensaries and shut them all down. Mm -hmm. uh, this is when we had Measure O in place, mm -hmm. which was, uh, you know, turned over in a legal uh, battle in court. So 
at the end of the day, uh, all those promises that were made to these dispensaries, uh, you know, didn't have to be kept because they were shut down. Right. And uh, it's kind of like, you know, very disingenuous, uh, you know, of the mayoral candidate to to uh, get that support and then and then not support, uh, you know, be able to support them back. Mm-hmm. So I think at the end of the day, it brings a really big controversy about this measure and, and people are looking at, you know, okay, how can we uh, have these dispensaries? Because there, I do believe that there are legit people that need this medical marijuana. Right. And right now, because all the dispensaries are shut down, they don't have access to it, you know, in a reasonable way. Right. And, um, I, you know, it brings up the whole question of like, you know, the self-medicating mm-hmm. and how much of this is, you know, um, you know, positive for the community, how much of this is positive for the for the folks and what else can be done to help folks heal from whatever their physical ailments are, their their mental trauma ailments are, and then how how the political system is really you know, the corruptness is very, like, predatory against vulnerable folks. You know, these folks who have, uh, you know, um, who are self-medicating for whatever reason, uh, whether it's physical, emotional, whatever, mm-hmm. um, you know, they they are being used mm-hmm. by the political candidate, um, you know, for the purpose of power. Right. And, and I think that that's very sad because our leadership should be focused on you know, what, it, what is going on where so many people are having so many health issues? Mm-hmm. Like, is it the environment? Is mm-hmm. it the air quality? Is it, you know, is it the food that we're eating? Like, right. are, you know, is it having a lot to do with poverty? You know, where are all the services to help people um, instead of just putting all this attention on dispensaries and kind of villainizing dispensaries mm-hmm. as the bad guys? And I just feel like, you know, all they're really doing is is people are trying to survive and people are trying to cope. You know? can, can I throw something out there real quick? Yeah. And I know we didn't necessarily talk about this, you know, before the show, but something that makes me think about is the prison industrial complex. Oh, yeah. And how right now, because cannabis is legal, there are so many folks that are working to get people that have been in prison for cannabis released. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And a huge part of that is, you know, many times that they say people were in prison because of a mental illness or something. Mm-hmm. So with all these changes that are happening, what do you think that's going to mean for us if, how do I say this, if, if we were to see that cannabis can be used just like any other medicine, if that makes sense? Because then we're going to have this influx of people that come back to society. Um, do you think that that's something that can be been can be beneficial for us. One of the of- one of the things I always talk to people about, you know, whenever we're talking about medicine mm-hmm. in general, especially from an indigenous perspective, right, is any medicine, any medicine can become bad and toxic. Mm. It, if if you gave me like ten gallons of water to drink right now, you know, water is life, and I love water, and it's good for you. But if you gave me ten gallons to drink right now, sure. I could literally poison my body by drinking too much water. Oh, yep. So it's like the villainizing of any medicine, you know, is just really a distraction from the real conversation about why people need medicine to be given. And yes, it goes back to genocide. It goes back to to trauma. It goes it it goes back to police brutality. It goes back to poverty. It goes back to social social stigma. We can't get that hope internally because our moms, dads, grandparents, etc., our elders are stigmatized. Right. That where can we go? We can't get the guidance of those who should be able to guide us because they were so stigmatized and misinformed. Right. It's, It's horrible. And it's funny because saying that, it just came to my mind that one of the things that I recently um, um, learned was, you know, as people, it's it's natural for us to carry traumas in our bodies. And so when you think about all the people that are impacted that use, you know, cannabis as a way to relieve pain, a lot of it is back pain or neck pain or just any general trauma that's in their body. And it's like, 
people aren't seeing that there could be a connection there. You know, all these things that are happening that are causing this trauma that we're holding on to in our body physically. And then what do we do? We try and find ways to actually self-medicate. And, you know, cannabis is a good way um, because you're not getting the same amount of toxins that you would normally get from, let's say, Tylenol or uh, was it ibuprofen that literally starts affecting your kidneys and your liver. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's so arbitrary which medications are over the counter and which medications are prescription and which medications are illegal, you know, like. It's so arbitrary. Like right. we have all these laws and rules, and we've all the data is out there. We know alcohol is more damaging than than cannabis. Right? right? You know, we know. You know, we know. Yeah. We know. We know so much about about the the science behind right. this stuff. Isn't it funny how everyone's just now really like opioids? What? Oh my gosh, we really need to handle this. It's like too little, too late. Too yeah. Little, too late. That. My my idea I had to self advocate because she started feeling herself get stupid with all those pain pills they were giving her mm-hmm. that was overdoing that. And with the little that she did take as prescribed, as prescribed, uh, she needed to detox. Like and it affected her memory loss. Like I was showing her photos of me in drag and she forgets that I'm gay that same night. <laughs> I'm like, oh wow. Because then she's like, Oh, that's you and what is who's that, your girlfriend? I was like, No. Gay, remember here. Here's a picture of me as Linda Ronstadt. Remember, like oh. drag queen, gay, <laughs> godson, nephew of yours here. Like, wow. It's like she has. She admits she's like, you know what? I've been so stuck on stupid for months now because of these opioids that they gave me, and I had to just stop because I just couldn't function. And she needs to function. Everybody does. Yeah, that kind of brings up something we were talking earlier about. You yep. want to talk about that, Matt? With yeah. Little... So um, one of the trending topics that's happening right now is um, the Roseanne show is being revived as the Connors. And if I'm not mistaken, it's debuting tonight. And the way they're starting the show off is they are killing Roseanne off by saying that she overdosed on opioids. Um, that's basically the piggyback off of what people have already thought about the actual actress, Roseanne, because of her outbreak, uh, or her, how, how do we say it, her, her lashing out at Valerie Jarrett and calling her, or saying she looked like an ape. Um, and one of the things that we were talking about before the show got started was the fact that I am admitting this, but not admitting this. So I woke up to her, Roseanne, having a conversation with Joe Rogan, and talking about at the age of 19, she had been in like an accident or something and had like some brain damage and then actually ended up being committed. Now, I'm not trying to shame anyone who has any type of mental health issue, but she's admitting that there's a reason behind her madness, if that makes sense. And a part of what's going on in her brain is, She's not really able to tell the difference between um, she doesn't have a clear line of boundaries, I guess I can say, where she's saying in her mind, she's thinking, you know, when she's making these comments that she knows that she's not going to be politically correct. But at the same time, there's 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 a line there that she's just crossed where I don't think that she's completely in touch with reality anymore. Mm. Um, And I like the fact that the Connor show is going to kind of talk about how. You can get addicted to these pills and things, but I'm not sure that that show is even needed anymore. Yeah, I think that's so interesting because it really goes back to what we just said, right, about how random it is about what is prescription, what is illegal. Yes. And what is legal, like, you know, in many cases, you know, these opioids are probably way more dangerous than, you know, like things that are being considered legal. You know, so it's just like. The rationale behind that is crazy, but it really digs down to the issue of like, okay, let's look at this case. Like this was a 19 year old person who had a trauma and a brain injury, you know, and, and like, had there been services in place to really support her through that trauma and injury, like good free mental health services for yeah. everybody regardless of health insurance and health care you know like uh or uh, if there had been the you know the access to the right doctors 
you know, maybe the answer wouldn't have been just to dope her up on some some medicine and then right. let her out the door, you know, on her way. Right. And I think that that's indicative of what happens for most folks who end up self-medicating. Yes. Because they don't have access to the Mayo Clinic and they don't have access to health care probably 80 or 90 percent of the time. Well, Kanye. Yeah, 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 exactly. And so they go to, you know, uh, to these other forms to get some kind of relief, self-relief. But um, there's a really great book that I want to point folks to. Um, it's called Post Traumatic uh, Slave Syndrome. Ooh. And it was written by Joy de the group oh she is yeah. amazing yes. dr joy yes. yes dr joy and i saw i had the immense privilege of seeing dr joy at the national conference of race and ethnicity where i went with some of our folks uh, uh earlier this year and the book is amazing but it basically digs down to the whole idea of intergenerational trauma yep. and ptsd yep. And how that, uh, it, you know, comes from slavery. Mm-hmm. But it's so easy to unpack that to to all types of different people, to indigenous people like Darby was talking about, you know, who went through similar t- forms of genocide and trauma, you know, to women, to LGBTQ oh, folks, to, yeah, you know, like to Chicanos. I mean, we could just go down the list of right. all the folks who, who have had those types of experiences. And once you start to understand what the mental health impact is, not just on the individuals experiencing the trauma, but the generations after that, you know, you start to really understand, Hey, again, connect the dots. This is some kind of conspiracy. (laughs) And it's true. I mean, it's grossly impacting. I'd say people of color more than anyone in the world. Just look at the way a lot of people of color can, similarly joke about their childhood um, physical discipline. Yes. And it's like, and if you go back, that wasn't really the norm prior to white colonization. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. like, I told you last night, Mary, like, I had an aunt who, you know, love her dearly, name a name, you know, she, uh, one or two of her kids, she uh, hung from a tree, like, you know, they didn't die, but it was like, from the wrist or something like mm-hmm. it wasn't a news, but either way it was like a form that wow. happened and there's this also famous song a Spanish song I'm not too sure who sang it but I do think they were Mexican a rancher Mexican mm-hmm. um, about how he tied off his daughter's um, hands mm. uh, it's a, it's a, it was really popular back in like whatever 90s Mexican Spanish station my parents would listen to but it would mm-hmm. be like constantly played and I'm like about, is that what I think it is? And he's like, yeah, like, the thing you're saying about, like, how he took it overboard with uh, disciplining his daughter and, like, tying her up around the post and her, leaving her out there for too long that her hands lost uh, circulation. And it happened. Mm. She died. Like, she didn't die. Like, she had to live like that. Now. Mm. And now he has to take care of her even more. I'm like, holy shit, that's fucked up. And I'm not saying that we don't have uh, indigenous ancestors that didn't do horrible things, but that wasn't the horrible things were done to people like who were um, like victims or like uh, what was it um captured from war like, oh mm-hmm. uh, so POWs basically yeah. prisoners of their prisoners of war or but eventually they got sacrificed and killed quickly but regardless uh, it, it's just when you look at uh, a lot of ours that trauma is there mm-hmm. and every generation tries to make it better I think these recent few generations mm-hmm. but there's always that constant um, Hiccuping, things don't go as planned. Mm-hmm. And it's also, I think, especially for those of us who are first generation Americanized, mm-hmm. like we have this idea of what we should be according to our culture, and then we have this idea of this new culture that we're all being in, uh, so, uh, assimilating to, mm-hmm. but that our parents are trying to assimilate to while keeping their culture and their identity, and then us trying to form something around that and getting all this misinformation, which is a is the real tea. The information is like to say, oh, America's better and brighter and capitalism will save the world. And, mm-hmm. You know, dog eat dog is just the way it is, but every dog has his day and it's like all this bullshit that no matter how much shit you'll deal with, you're going to turn out fine. Look at every sitcom ever. And it's like, no. Mm-hmm. And we, when we get so disconnected in just one generation between parents and children mm-hmm. and then grandchildren 
and great grandchildren to forget about it. So that's why it's very important for us to always um, hone in into our ancestry and um, have these conversations that we're having and call out the abuse and the trauma that has been forced upon us that comes out in certain ways. Okay, I'm changing your nickname. <laughs> You're now going to be Mr. Segway because you just segue us right? each little right. component that but we But real quick, so VW, <laughs> what are we voting on for that? Yes? No? Yes. Yes on both? I believe yes. What do you think, Matt? Um, I think it is supposed to be yes on both. Um, the V and W? It's w and X. W and X. Um, I have some issues with X just because I don't know that limiting, limiting the amount of locations is wise because they're doing it um, per, I think it's like 7,500 people. So that equaled um, to 17 shops, if I'm not mistaken. You know, these shops are adding to the community. They are adding business. They are adding taxpayers. And it's legit. And I think the thing that sometimes we miss out on or sometimes what's happening is you're creating an opportunity for people to become an entrepreneur. Um, mm-hmm. One of the things that I was looking at before the, the show started is there's going to be an American Cannabis Summit that happens on October 23rd. The problem with that, though, is it's all white. Huh, or from what I'm seeing oh, on the internet, is it's all white. Y'all know Coca-Cola wants to do weed-infused Coke, right? I heard that. Yeah, talking about white and big business. And, again, you know, we talk about these marginalized communities that have always used or always had cannabis around. Suddenly, you know, now that it's legal, these big white businesses want to come in and take it over. I mean, I think we, uh, Mary, we had talked about kind of how we see that happening here in San Bernardino. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I I totally get your concerns about Measure X. And we've been talking about a, a lot about this in the community. And I think what we kind of come to is the understanding that uh, when we had a previous uh, city ordinance that right. was just wide open to any number of, of dispensaries, like the public kind of wasn't ready for that right. and they like freaked out. Right? right. And so ultimately that got killed in the courts and uh, people were not on board with it. Right? right. So we really, you know, it's important that those of us who are knowledgeable about these issues and might be able to connect more of the dots, that we also understand where the community is. Yes. And the community is not quite all the way there with cannabis, you know, yet. Right. And so it's like we got to like take, I think, steps. And yes. so the way we're looking at Measure X is it's a good step right. to start with these 17 locations and then hopefully have some good experiences. Definitely making sure that small businesses are there and represented, right. that it's not just taken over by cannabis corporations. Uh, as I understand it, there is like a kind of advisory board mm-hmm. that is involved with this uh, this uh, initiative and that uh, a number of folks who sit on that board are small business owners mm-hmm. and not corporations. And mm-hmm. so as long as we see that balance there mm-hmm. where there's more small business than there is corporation, mm-hmm. I think we'll feel oh pretty good about it. Um, but the concern mm-hmm. is definitely there that, that we do hope that this piece of, le- of policy will end up with another policy that opens it a little wider and a little wider, especially as we in the community do our job Mm -hmm. of raising awareness about how cannabis has been villainized, right? So that Mm -hmm. means we got to start talking about hemp. We got to start talking about the environmental sustainability factors. Mm -hmm. We got to start talking about the food uh, factors, you know, like all these other factors beyond just the medicated cannabis, but all the reasons why hemp and cannabis could be solutions for our communities, not just the medication piece. And I just want to throw out there that we also need to take a look at what Oakland is doing, because Oakland's doing a lot of progressive work where they have. Okay, so when it comes to Oakland, They've broken it down where there's a certain amount of licenses that they'll give out to folks that are big business. And I forget what the exact number is, but there's a large number that they've saved for people that have been incarcerated for the same reason so that they're able to come out. And if they're still interested in being in that business, they're the ones that get the first choice. They get to pick first what they want and where they want to be. Because again, it's about building, you know, community and building small businesses. So well, that's and about got a clientele base. That's uh-huh. about straight up making amends and reparations, exactly. right? Exactly. Like the very understanding that brown and black folks have been incarcerated 
for something that we are now saying is legal and personal and, and, and perfectly reasonable and that how do we make amends for that? Well, if you took away X number of years of their lives, yep. then you better uh, make sure they have an ample opportunity when they come back. That's part of reparations, you know? Yep. And so we've talked about that before. Like, that would be great. I would totally support something like that. But again, I think we've got to do a lot of groundwork right. to make sure the community is ready for that and understands it. And, um, you know, just to raise the awareness about about all the cannabis and hemp related solutions that yep. could be available for our communities. Like yep. we're talking about building homes, you know, right. in an area where we have tons of homelessness. Yep. I mean, we, there's so many solutions that could come from this. If we would only uh, just start getting the public to talk about it and make sure that it's not a political conversation. And that's the problem is mm-hmm. so far measure X and measure W and the mayor's race and all of mm-hmm. that has been totally politicized and it hasn't given the chance for the community to speak up about what the community needs and to talk about some of those solutions. And then you kind of mentioned earlier, mm-hmm. like uh, Mr. Segway over here was, mm-hmm. was giving us a great segue over to talk about Kanye, right? Oh, okay. So, More like Kanye. <laughs> yes. So I know on black Twitter and other social media, Kanye has been said to be dead. And I don't like to really use that terminology, but I think the biggest issue that we don't talk about when it comes to Kanye is his mental health. Mm -hmm. Like right now, you know, he's, he was on Saturday night live and I watched the episode. And first of all, he comes on the show, he brings three different musical guests, which they don't always do, but, you know, sparingly, they'll, they'll let that happen. The songs that he chooses to show on the show are not TV ready, per se, just because they're maybe two or three minutes long, but the majority of their lyrics are all um, have expletives, so all cuss words, so mm-hmm. literally on the spot they're having to adjust. Then he goes on to have this rant at the end of the show, which... Um, if you see, if you saw it live or if you caught it the first time it aired, you got to see the rant. If you didn't catch it and you see the replay, they've edited his rant out just because he goes on this whole rant about Donald Trump and how his MAGA hat is his Superman cape and how the, the cast and crew of Saturday Night Live bullied him. And then last week, Pete Davidson, who's one of the, the cast from Saturday Night Live, said that no one gave him trash the whole week that he was there rehearsing with them. Nobody cared. Now, they were uncomfortable, but it was just this whole thing that he was on, and then, you know, he's rambling, and then he visits Donald Trump. And he sits there, and he starts to ramble again, and talking about what it's like to be fatherless, and how, you know, the black youth are impacted because their fathers aren't home, and then how he's so proud to know Donald Trump. And again, him, you know, wearing that hat and him wanting to hug Trump. And, you know, people are sitting there looking at him and these cameras are just a flashing because they're realizing that he is insane. (laughs) He is insane. And no one is telling him or pulling him away or turning off the cameras to say, this guy needs help. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like everyone kind of talks about it, but no one is physically taking him to get the mental help that he needs. I'm all sorry for the rant. It's just, no, I, I just am frustrated. Like I, I, that's people of color, especially men of color and black men of color. Right. That's mental health stigma in action, right? Like, yes. Like, um, I definitely can relate to this, uh, working in the community in the frontline community where we have sometimes folks, you know, really in an unhealthy place with their mental health, you know? Right. And it's like, you know, the sheer numbers of folks who are struggling with suicide, with mm-hmm. self-harm, with psychosis. With, I mean, it's just, it blows my mind, literally blows my mind, the sheer number of folks. Right. And to understand that those of us who don't struggle with that, that that is an incredible amount of privilege, mm-hmm. an incredible amount of privilege, that, that we have an obligation to really lift the voices of those folks now, here is someone who's struggling with mental illness, but also has an incredible amount of privilege, right? Yes. So he could be lifting that voice in a very productive, 
in, a, in an advocacy way. He could be using his voice and his power to really highlight the struggle of folks who don't have privilege and how mental illness is, is contributing to them being in prison, to them being homeless, to them being hungry, but, you know, but he's not doing that. And he, I don't think he can at the moment because he's not taking his medicine. Mm -hmm. And again, not to say that, you know, that type of medication is the best type of medication, but he needs something to stabilize his mood. Mm -hmm. And he is not stable right now. You know, he's going back and forth having these like manic episodes where you see him everywhere and having these conversations and having these delusions and these different psychoses. And then you'll see him and he's just kind of chilling. And that's when, you know, he's coming back down. And it's like, again, no one's literally grabbing him and saying, look, we need to put you here. We need to get you on something so that you can at least get stable again. So what you're saying is no one basically loves him enough unconditionally to keep him from from harming himself. Yes. Like, you know? And that's the celebrity life. That that's the celebrity life. Right. Like you have to really be peculiar about it. We're in the generation where people are famous for being famous. Yes. And we're all about, once again, the doggy dog, everybody has their day, etc. And that's just like, oh, he's just the one who's down. Mm -hmm. But it's like, it, it just goes to show, now imagine somebody who doesn't have that access. Right. How horrible that is. And, you know, he brought up about, like, fathers not being there in the black community. Well, it's like, well, like, hello? Like, mm -hmm. You're hugging the person who's keeping that. Right. Like, and I understand. I'll probably be like, okay, cool. Like, that's your mental health, whatever. Personally, I've never been a big fan of Kanye or his, he's been very patriarchal. Mm -hmm. So anybody who's like that, whatever their gender or their oppression may be, whatever their identity is, if you're very patriarchal, I'm just like, whoop, water off my ducks, off the ducks back, whatever mm -hmm. you say. But um, seeing all this and seeing how it impacts people is very um, eye-opening. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's just, this is also like, okay, check in on your black friends. Mm -hmm. Check in. If you ever want to play that black friend card, do get to check in on them, especially during this time. And I think the thing that hurts and is hurting the culture with Kanye is Kanye was supposed to be this visionary. You know, Kanye is the one that, you know, um, came out on, what was that? Um, I forgot that show, and he, but he basically said, you know, that George Bush didn't oh, care yeah. about black folks. And that was during a time when people were afraid to say anything, but he was the one that was willing to kind of be that voice. And so I think that people are caught up with nostalgia a little bit saying, you know, that was the Kanye that we had versus the Kanye that we have now. And the Kanye we have now, everyone just wants to say he's a Kardashian, that this is a plot or this is this thing. And it's like, well, started with you talking about how people are being famous for being famous. That's the thing. They're this famous family who has been in the media for, you know, the, 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 well, let's say the patriarch transitioning. You know what I mean? And that was a thing. That was a scandal for a while for them. And that kept them going because then they got to live out their whole life on keeping up with the Kardashians talking about that and how Caitlyn made that transition. And then, you know, you've had the different daughters who've had the different babies and whatnot. And that was a storyline. And now we have Kanye who is suffering and this is their new storyline. So you mean like the Kardashians in general because of the father. Not the, uh, not the Jenners. Yeah, no, I'm about the Jenners. Uh, what's his name? Rob Kardashian? So, oh. Yeah, and that's since then they've been famous. I thought you were going back there. Yeah, yeah, I'm not going that far back. Uh, yeah, but... So, like, here's the thing, right? Like, why do we idolize people so easily? Yeah, it, idolizing people, that's all bad to begin with, right? That's ego. Let's right. talk about our ancestors constantly chin-checking us about ego, right? Like, right. I mean, like, I, I, yeah, <laughs> I, 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 just, I just feel like the thing with Kanye that I think mm -hmm. you're really bringing out, though, is the idea of the stigma of mental health, yes. right? Like, mm -hmm. that clearly people are so, like, them being nostalgic about him in the past and saying that's the real Kanye and this person is just, we don't know who he is, so it's like we can just throw him away mm -hmm. because he doesn't really exist, doesn't really see the whole person right. with his mental illness, right. you know? Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. It devalues him because of his mental illness. Mm -hmm. And although I deplore Trump and I, I deplore the idea of like, you know, uh, someone being allied with Trump at the expense of people of color, especially black folks, Mm -hmm. like, you know, but, but at the same time, it's like, this person really is struggling with a mental illness. Like, the, the our response cannot be to be as bad as Trump, right? right. The, ignoring the the mental illness would be something Trump would do, you know, like right. would be like the the whole like stigma and participating in that and the villainizing of him would be something Trump would do. Like right. so it's like I don't want to participate in that. What I want to participate in is a real conversation about mental health stigma. And how do we help our loved ones, um, our coworkers, our friends, our community members who are in this state where they stop taking their meds, where they don't do what's good for their own mental health? How can we hold them accountable with love, but also keep the community safe? You know, right. and this is the ongoing discussion we've been having for weeks now. Right. Right. Like this has been the theme of everything we talk about is accountability with love. And what does that look like? Mm-hmm. Um, so before we wrap it up, I just want to talk about one more thing that that came up. Um, the Elizabeth Warren situation and her DNA. <laughs> I call bullshit on that. I call bullshit on that forever ago. <laughs> oh, my God. When she claims it, I'm like anytime anybody claims anything. It's just like, OK. Like, have you all read the articles? <laughs> I have not read all of it. I have it. You guys have to break it down There's to me. some open letter articles asking, like, where you been, sis? Yep. Like, Sandy Rock, Pipelines, etc. Like, even um, Indian Country. Is it, mm-hmm. I think that's a publication. Yeah, Indian yeah. Country, yeah. Indian, uh, country, Indian Country today. Yeah. yeah. They, when she was first making these claims, mm-hmm. were like, so what's up? Like, so what's up? And yeah. it's just like, she curved them. Mm-hmm. And it's like, and, and at the end of the day, they're calling her out, like, 2020 is around the corner. Yep. You're trying to be the president. Yep. You've had all this backing from a lot of natives, too. Mm-hmm. But what have you done? And what are you even going to do besides just saying, I took a DNA test. Yeah. I have like a 0.5% yeah, native. She, in she, me. She's 132nd. I think it was like, I thought it was Cherokee or something like that. Mm-hmm. Because, there's, no, there was no claim. It's just that the DNA test says like 1% of her was native. And the reason she was doing that, if you remember, is all along when she was campaigning and things before, Trump kept calling her Pocahontas. <laughs> and so he made, what was it? He said that he'd pay. I laughed. It was like, I forget how many million, but there's a certain amount of million that he would donate if she actually had Native ancestry. Mm-hmm. And so now she's done the test and has provided it. And now it's kind of one of those like, OK, what are you going to do now? And then I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, it was the Cherokee Nation that came out. And said, we don't claim you. Nobody mm. claims her. Nobody claims her. Just saying that you have these tests don't say what tribe you're from. Right. And these tribes already have uh, laws and rules set in place that the government, the U.S. government, put in place as well. Right. So these are bullshit laws to begin with. Uh, but yeah, it's just one of those like, and I didn't know that the shoe was actually going to get like money donated to something. Okay, then yeah, where's that money gonna go? Well, Trump said that on a very on a campaign trail yeah. type thing, and he it was recorded and videotaped. Yep. And then when so he didn't mean it, well, yeah, well, folks went and asked him. He was like, "Oh no, you better t- check the transcript." I didn't say that. Like he tried to he tried to weasel out of it, but it's on videotape that he said that he would if she took the DNA test, uh-huh. he would donate to the chari- to a charity of their choice or whatever. Mm-hmm. But um, I think the real issue with that, though, is, like, let's talk about blood blood quantum, right? Mm. Because if we're really going to talk about decolonizing, like, our ancestors did not do blood quantum. Like, you know, F that. Like, Mm -hmm. we, uh, we, the conversation about indigenous, native, like, first peoples, like, all that kind of stuff is not about blood quantum. And those people who are still stuck on being a certain percentage or being one sixteenth or one thirty second or what whatever, <laughs> you know, you that is pretty much the 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 proof that I need that you are not indigenous mm. and you're doing that. Like that is exactly what is against, you know, the whole idea of 
what being native is, you know? Mm. And so for, for folks who are really trying to walk a walk of connecting with their ancestors, of living there, uh, certainly for folks who suffered the, you know, having to live on the res, you know, mm-hmm. all the, all the, all the stigma and all the, the negatives of this society puts because of colonization mm-hmm. on indigenous people, you know, losing your language, losing your customs, mm-hmm. not, cutting your hair, mm-hmm. putting you in boarding school, you know, like, let's take go your children, take it, stealing your children. Yeah. Like, let's go down the list of all that. And, and, you know, and those folks who have suffered that, those are the folks who get to call themselves indigenous. Mm-hmm. And, and I don't care what the percentage is or the blood quantum or the, the fraction of, it's all about like, you know, what are you doing to work on decolonization? And if you're doing that path, you know, that is the way that you're going to truly reconnect with your ancestry. And that is the way that you're going to fix everything that's wrong with society today. And I just want to just say, you know, thank you, Mary, and thank the folks from Chica, because one thing that I have learned with being present and being able to be here is that there's a certain amount of pride that you take in the land and naming, you know, your ancestors and tribes and things that you're attached to. And I don't know how many of us can do that. I don't know how many of us know where we come from and to be able to say this is the land of X, Y, Z people. Like, this is the Serrano yeah. people, correct? Yeah, this is Yuviatan, Serrano, Coahuila land, because our people didn't live in borders. They moved over different regions. And this land that we are occupying is the territory of those peoples. Thank you. And again, I'm just so grateful that you all have that knowledge. And that's something that you continue to share. Because again, so many people don't know that. Mm-hmm. And I think we take that for granted. And I think if people were to really look at all of their, like, for those people that own their homes, look at what your your, your deeds say. It talks about how this isn't land that we own. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We don't own this land. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we're visitors. We're guests here. And we have to honor that. And so I think a part of what Elizabeth Warren's doing is it's a political stunt. Mm-hmm. And I think it's taken away from the power of what the indigenous movement is all about. Yes, yes, I agree. <laughs> So before we go, any last um, advertisements or comments or anything that you want to throw out there for folks out there in the IE and around the world? I'll just remind you again, and Documented Student Week at San Bernardino Valley College. You can follow it on hashtag Undocumented Student Action Week, and you will see uh, actions at not just our local colleges, but colleges all around the state. I invite folks to come out tomorrow to the Know Your Rights training at 1230 and also on Thursday at 1130, we'll be doing the mental health and self-care. And hopefully this whole conversation will inspire you to really pursue your own uh, self-care and mental health needs. And then we're also going to have a healing circle later that afternoon. So we really want folks to be there and be a part of the Indigenous Healing Circle, which we believe is the way that we get away from self-medicating, the way that we get away from some of these other uh, coping mechanisms and get back to our ancestors and what they did uh, for their self-care. RB, anything from you? Uh, So thank you, Mary, and thank you, uh, Matt, for having me. Um, So Chica here next Friday will be having our case sesh uh, that I'll be hosting. So please come out to Chica. It'll be around five, six, I believe. Yeah. Uh, it'll be on Chica. <laughs> 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 and then uh, my calendars for November 18th, uh, which is Transgender Day of Remembrance. We'll be having a vigil um, out in Riverside at the uh, First Congregational Church, okay. I would say. Uh, and, uh, then after, following the TDOR, We'll be celebrating life, so we'll be having royalty on the roof, uh, which is a celebration of trans lives and successes. Uh, we'll be showcasing trans and queer artists and their stories. Woo! And that's at Riverside City Hall. That's um, six to nine, but we'll actually be there early, so you can come straight after because I think TDR ends at five. So uh, you can come straight after or go get a bite to eat, whatever. <laughs> but yes, uh, there will be refreshments and food. Okay. And if you haven't been to Royalty on the Roof, like Chica has always, uh, it's one of our favorite events that we really encourage you to 
to check it out. It's a beautiful venue. It's a beautiful event. It's beautiful stories and beautiful people. And um, it's just a really great event. So please, please support World War III. And I got to ask a real question, though, for, for, for the folks that are going to be there. Should we bring dollars for tipping? Oh, yes, yes, and just any donations you want to make. Like, definitely, there's going to be uh, artists selling uh, their artwork, and there will be uh, trans performers who do a song, do a number, whatever they do, they work it out. I have no qualms of what they do. Uh, but yes, and uh, to be, you know, they do get paid because that's part of the funding that we raise, but we always promote that people tip them extra because why not? It's part of the fun. Right. But yes, yeah, all ages at Riverside City Hall. The great team, Greer Pavilion, uh, be there any time between five and six. And proceeds also go to the scholarship fund. Yes, all proceeds. Uh, basically, all proceeds are going to be going to scholarships. That's uh, once we just have our uh, everything paid off for the event, which mm-hmm. isn't too much. Uh, all donations that we are going to start gathering from now on, and we've been gathering. Um, the uh, my dear friend Alicia Wilkins, who is the commissioner, the chair of the commission on the status of women and uh, girls here in California, mm-hmm. she got us a donation of five hundred dollars. Uh, so that's helping uh, for scholarship for payments of the venue and payment of the performers. Obviously, five hundred only goes so far, but five hundred here and there from different donors is what helps put these events together. Uh, so we're definitely glad that we have the state state level. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, for ourselves, for the podcast, we are actually currently under review by Apple. And we may be able to um, be officially listed as a podcast there. Um, also, we want to throw out that coming up on October 25th from 3.30 to 5, there's a public forum on Measures W and Measure X which is a cannabis business tax and cannabis licensing measure, is going to be at San Bernardino Valley College, which is 701 South Mount Vernon Avenue in San Bernardino, California, 92410. And, oh, and also last but not least, my most current um, sermon, which is There's No Place Like Home, is going to be listed on my website, which is www.mysticalministry.com. Ooh, that was a mouthful. (laughs) So again, thank you all for listening today. Uh, Have a great night.